Good morning. It is great to see all of you this morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church on this Pentecost Sunday. What a special day to be in the house of the Lord. Our ushers are coming now and uh, they're beginning to pass out the attendance pads. We thank you for the information that you fill out there and would like for everyone to do that. While you're doing that, I want to send a special greeting to our guests that are with us today and welcome you. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy our worship time together. While you're doing all of that, uh, check out, give you another thing to do, pull out your bulletin and check out all the announcements there. One big announcement that I want to lift up to you is that this week is annual conference. And I want to ask for your prayers as we go to Covington. Uh, several from this church will be going to represent uh, you and the other churches. And uh, we pray that you will pray for us. Pray for wisdom and guidance and direction as we take care of business there at the annual conference conference. Lots of other activities coming up. Check your bulletin out. Take it home. Don't leave it in your pew, but take it home and be a part of all the great activities that we have happening here at First United Methodist Church. Now friends, let's stand and let's greet one another. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place and we give thanks for it. Now friends, let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. It has been said that the early Christians were careful to honor the assembly careful to honor the assembly. They did so with their punctuality, their presence, their participation, and their attention. Make a note, some of the assemblies may have been boring. <laughs> not here, not today. However, some of them may have been life-changing. We've already been blessed today. It's not too late to ask for life-changing. Let's stand together as we read our call to worship responsively and for hymn number 57, be careful to follow the instructions in your bulletin. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were gathered together in the upper room. They were waiting for a sign from God. At the sound of a mighty rushing wind, the Holy Spirit descended upon them. Like tons of fire. The Holy Spirit rested on each of them. That day the disciples were changed forever. When the Holy Spirit touches us, we can never be the same. God comes to us in the presence of the Holy Spirit that we might be enabled to do God's will in the world. Change us, Lord, that we might feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. This morning as we go to God in prayer, we give thanks that we can pray. 
And we give thanks for God's Spirit as it touches our hearts, as God hears our prayers. We pray for our, uh, a prayer of gratitude for celebration. We pray for our needs. And so let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. God, as we gather here today, we give thanks for the opportunity, the opportunity to pray and to give thanks for your many blessings upon our lives. We glorify your name this day, O Lord, and give thanks for the opportunity to, to share with one another the blessings that you have given us. And it's an honor to know that you are with us, present with us in all things. Today, Lord, we are your church, and we thank you for the churches all around us and for your spirit at Pentecost that birthed the new church. We're grateful, Lord, to carry on those traditions, to carry on those ministries and missions, to carry on the word to the, of good news to those in need. Holy God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today to worship. And as we worship, we pray for those that are on our hearts and our minds that are not well. For the sick and the hurting, we lift them to you, O God. And may your blessing be upon them. May your healing in the name of Jesus be upon them. And may you use us for your, as instruments of your healing. We pray for those who grieve, those who've lost loved ones. And in their hearts, O oh Lord, we pray that your overflowing love will fill. We thank you, O oh God, for all that you do, for the opportunity to be here and to serve. And now, Lord, as we pray a, a prayer of gratitude for not only ourselves, our neighbors, our community, our nation, and our world, we thank you for those who are willing and able to get on the front line and protect the freedom and the liberty that we so enjoy. Bless us now, O oh God, as we now unite our voices and we share the prayer that you taught your own disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
want to share with you the scripture for today from Acts chapter 2. And certainly you can follow along, but I might encourage you just to listen today. You know this scripture, and if you've heard it before, hear it again for the first time. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, the day of Pentecost had come, and the day of Pentecost had come, come again, come anew, because it is ever coming, the kingdom of God, and we are ever becoming the, the kingdom. kingdom of God. And they were all together in one place. Pentecost began with all together. They were all together in one place. And it ended with all together. And all who believed were together. Pentecost has to do with getting it together. And we are all together in one place, in this one place. This room, this community, this country, this county, this continent, this hemisphere, this planet. Pentecost has to do with getting us together. And suddenly there was a sound that came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and resting on each of them. The rush of a mighty wind. The same wind that brushed over the face of the deep. The tongues licking like fire. The same fire that burned before Moses, all bushy-faced. The wind and the fire, rushing, brushing, bushing out to remind us that the God who created us has come among us. That the God who reveals has come among us. That God has come among us. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Tower of Babel turned inside out and right side up. Not people scattered abroad over the face of the earth. But gathering from abroad over the face of the earth. Finding a place, not Shinar, but Salem saying, Come, let us take, make, not burned bricks, but ourselves, stones, living stones, I presume. And saying, Let us take, not make, take a name for ourselves, the name of our Lord our God. And the Lord saying, This, this is, is the only, only the beginning, beginning of what they, they will do. And at this sound, a multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Speak, Church of God. Speak, Church of God, in the name of God, the words of God. Speak, but speak Church them in their own language. Speak in Spanish and Swahili. In binary code and pidgin. Speak in street talk, straight talk. But, but speak, speak in their own language. language. They were amazed and wondered, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Yes, from Galilee. And from Frankfurt and Jet, accented with accents of the cowering corners of the world and the frayed edges of the earth. Who would have thought? Galilee teaching Jerusalem? Who would have thought? Fishermen teaching Pharisees? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabi Arabians. And Kenyans and Kansans. Afghanis and Arizonans. Germans and Georgians, Panamanians and Pennsylvanians, Indians and Indianans, each of us in our own native language. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. The mighty works of God. The mighty works, works of God. The mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? 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 But others mocking said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and he addressed them. 
men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem and in Lawrenceburg and in Georgetown and in Owenton let this be known to you and to you and to you and to you for these men are not drunk as you suppose for it's only nine o'clock in the morning but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel Isaiah and Jeremiah Lamentations Ezekiel Daniel and Hosea Joel and in the last days it shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh all flesh all flesh all flesh and it shall be whoever that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man attested to you by God which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men but God raised him up having loosed the pangs of death this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what, Brethren, shall, we do? what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children. And to all that are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about... Three thousand. Three thousand. Three thousand souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And fellowship. To the breaking of bread. And the prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, were together and, and had all, all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The day of Pentecost had come. And the day of Pentecost has come. Come again. Come again. Because it is ever coming, the kingdom of God. And we are ever becoming the, the kingdom, kingdom of God. God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you. I'm going to ask our children to come forward now. birthdays yeah what do you do on a birthday celebrate. have fun celebrate your birth what celebrate. celebrate get presents what else eat cake Mac Ma <laughs> smash your face in cake you did that once okay all right what else Houston I'm sorry Because of how old they are, yeah. So, yeah, some people smack pianos. And what? No, oh, sometimes people celebrate the birth of, or their baptism, sure, yeah, yeah. Today, you know, today is a, a birthday. You know whose birthday it is? 
It's the churches. Yeah. Did you hear the scripture that we just read? Well, that was the story of their birth. Isn't that amazing? And one of the things that the, the scripture tells us that there appeared tongues of fire over their heads. How many of you have a birthday cake and you like candles? You know how you do that? Well, the first church when it was born had candles too. And look at this beautiful table. See, it's supposed to look like there's fire coming up and that's the tongues of fire. Miss Marcia did that for us and we appreciate her doing that so much. Yes, you We remember that. That's right. You see the candles that are lit around the church today? And part of that is just celebrating the, 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 the presence of God's Spirit on the people. That day, a lot of people came to know Jesus Christ. And it was kind of neat because Peter and the apostles were teaching. But you know what? They were teaching in all kinds of different languages. And they didn't go to school to learn that either. God's Spirit helped them do that. It's weird. Yeah. So, well, that's a good reason to celebrate, absolutely. And so today what we're doing is celebrating the birthday of the church, all right? Let's pray together, can we? Dear God, we thank you for this day and for the blessing that you give us through our children. They are precious. And we know that there are so many who have worked so hard to create this day for all of us. And so, Lord, help us to be mindful that we're not by ourselves, but we have family. We have friends. We have teachers and others who love us. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for your love through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Bless our children and their families now. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today's Steak and Shake's birthday? No, yesterday. Yesterday was, yeah. Okay. Well, let's go have one. So you guys are born on the <laughs> seated. Friends, when we think about Pentecost and what it means to us as Christians, both as a church and as individuals, I'm often reminded of the story, an older story about a University of Chicago distinguished professor whose granddaughter, small granddaughter, often came to visit him in his office. They would hold hands and walk around campus, and she was much smaller. One day, the professor had the little girl up on his shoulders, and uh, they came upon somebody that they had seen the week before, and this gentleman looked at the little girl and said, my goodness, look how much you've grown since I saw you last week. And the little girl kind of rolled her eyes, and she said, this is not all me. I'm not this big. I'm on my grandpa's shoulders. 
I love that little story because that's the way a sentiment, if you will, about you and me, my friends. We have been on the shoulders of others all of our lives. We actually go through riding on the shoulders of others. We go through life on the shoulders of our families, on the shoulders of teachers and mentors and many others. And in addition, we go through life riding on the shoulders of the great Christians of, of history, the great people of faith who have gone before us in our life. But most importantly, my friends, there's even something better. We've ran on the shoulders of God. Imagine if we could go back, as you heard that scripture today, imagine if we could go back and somehow uh, to that day of Pentecost and experience it firsthand, we would go to Simon Peter and say, wow, what an awesome sermon you preached. It was absolutely amazing. You stood and you preached with great courage and conviction, and your sermon was so powerful that 3,000 people joined the church. Isn't that amazing? By the way, I need to remind you, today at GNN, Annie and Donnie Estel joined our church, and we welcomed them at that service, and I wanted to let you know about that. The day of Pentecost had 3,000 people come to, to join the church. Isn't that amazing? We would say to Simon Peter, what a marvelous sermon you preached. What a great, uh, great uh, experience it was. You know what Peter would say to all that? He'd say, well, not all of that was me. Very little of it was me. It was the work of God. I was merely the instrument of God's Holy Spirit. I was riding on the shoulders of God's Holy Spirit. Now imagine if we could just fast forward a few years to those early Christians who worked so hard to get the church going. You know, we would talk to people like Paul and, and probably Peter, James and John and Andrew and Barnabas and Priscilla and Aquila and uh, Timothy. And we'd say, wow, what a great job you've done against all odds, against dangerous, life-threatening, and frightening persecution. You started churches in so many places. What an amazing accomplishment you have done. How did you do it? How did you find that courage and strength and energy to do all that you've done? And we know what those people would say. They'd say, well, not all of that was us. Very little of it actually was us. It was the work of God. We're merely the instruments of God's Holy Spirit. We've been riding on the shoulders of God's Spirit. And what if we fast forwarded to today? And we said to David and Roy and the choir, what beautiful music you bring us in the ringers too. I don't want to forget you guys. Thank you all. Uh, what beautiful music you bring us. And uh, what have we said to those who built this great structure and those who take care of it? And we said, what a beautiful building to worship the Lord in you have provided. And what if we talked to some of you volunteers who work so diligently in ministry and mission opportunities all across the land. And we said to you, what a great work you're doing for the Lord. You know what all of us would say, right? We would say, well, not all of that is me. Not all of that is something I did. It's the work of God's Spirit. We've been riding on the shoulders of God's Holy Spirit. My family, listen, all of us ought to be able to relate to that because um, we're all riding on the shoulders of others all the time. All of us are carried on the shoulders of our families and our friends and our colleagues and our church and most importantly, our God. Whenever we do something good, Whenever we strike a blow for justice, whenever we express our faith and our hope and love, whenever we say a kind word or perform a compassionate deed, whenever we exhibit courage and confidence and integrity, whenever we live in the spirit of Jesus Christ, not all of that is us. Actually, very little of it is. Oh, we like to take credit for it, don't we? But truly, it's not us. When we stand tall for what's right, when we live out the Christian lifestyle, we are merely instruments of God's Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. Let me give you a couple examples of how it works. Get out your note page real quickly. This is really short, so be, be, be ready. <laughs> One of the first things that, it, that the Holy Spirit does, it enables us to forgive. You might write that down. It enables us to forgive. 
If we're able to forgive, friends, it's simply because not all of that is us. I mean, if someone has done you wrong and you're trying to find the strength to forgive all on your own, I just say to you, good luck with that because that's probably not going to happen. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we're able to forgive. It's not, it's not, a, usu uh, it's, it's not a usual nature for us, uh, an immediate inclination to forgive. When somebody hurts us, what do we do? We get mad, we want vengeance, we want to show them a thing or two. That's our preferred reaction until our hearts are opened to the Holy Spirit. You see, it's God's Spirit that enables us to forgive. Maybe better said, when we forgive, it's not really us. It's the gracious Spirit or the gracious Holy Spirit of God forgiving through us. Everybody get it? All right, let's go on. Secondly, the Holy Spirit enables us to love unconditionally. This is hugely important. To love unconditionally. If we're able to love unconditionally, friends, it's simply because not all of this is us. It's so easy to love people that are attractive to us, isn't it? It's easy to love those who love us back. But that unconditional love, whew, that's a horse of another color, isn't it? Love to all, freely given. Love expecting nothing in return. Love with no strings attached. Love even to those who hurt us. Only God's Spirit, friends, can give us that strength to love like that. Only God's Holy Spirit can enable us to love like Jesus loved. Hmm. Finally, number three, the Holy Spirit enables us to build the church. Write that down. We want to build the church. And if we're able to do that, friends, it's simply because not all of this is us. Only the Holy Spirit can build a church. Only the Holy Spirit can empower the church. Only the Holy Spirit can sustain the church. The church can, a church, well, I'd say it this way. A church without the Holy Spirit is no church at all. You know, there's a powerful uh, example to us of how we're built on the shoulders of others. How many of you remember that movie, Mr. Holland's Opus? Did any of you see that? Any of, a lot of you did. It's just a movie about a guy named Glenn Holland. At the beginning of his music career, he had these dreams that he wanted to be a composer in Hollywood of great movies. But his dreams never came true. He spent his time working as a, as a music teacher at John F. Kennedy High School. And with great tenderness, he works with a, a little red-haired girl with pigtails who wants to play the clarinet. But nobody believes in her. Nobody helps her. No one encourages her except Mr. Holland. He works with great compassion with an African-American kid that wants to play the drums but just can't seem to find the beat. And then he works with great patience with a, a streetwise tough kid who's got a bad attitude and he's down on the world. Mr. Holland helps them and so many hundreds more. And at the end of the movie, you see Glenn Holland. He's there. He's got gray hair and he's retired, retiring. He's cleaning out his office. His wife and his son are there with him. And he's lamenting the fact that, as he says, I am a failure. I never accomplished my goal of being a great composer in movie, for Hollywood movies. Anyway, you see that final scene where he opens the door and he walks out with his box. And his shoulders are kind of slumped. And they walk down the hallway. When they get near the auditorium, they hear some noise. And he opens the door and he sees that the auditorium is jam-packed with his former students. And when he opens the door, they all stand in a standing ovation, a thunderous ovation. And he walks down toward the front. And there at the microphone is that little red-headed girl with pigtails. Except she's all grown up now. In fact, she's the governor of the state. And she says to him, Mr. Holland, we know you never got to become that famous composer that you dreamed of being. But don't you see? Your greatest composition is what you did with us, your students. Mr. Holland, look around. We are your great opus. Mr. Holland, <laughs> We're the music of your life. My family, you know, if we would just take a moment and look around us, 
I don't believe it would take long at all for us to realize that we are called as well to be God's music to the world, singing the song of forgiveness, singing the song of love, unconditional love, singing the song of, 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 of the church's great faith. But we don't do that by ourselves. I cannot do that by myself. And neither can you. We must share in that together. The good news of the Christian faith is we don't have to do it alone. God is truly with us. The Holy Spirit, friends, is our strength. It is our guide. It is our inspiration, our comfort, our teacher. The Holy Spirit enables us to forgive and to love unconditionally and to build the church. As Christians, friends, we live daily in an attitude, we can live daily in an attitude of humility because we know that it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us, my friends. It's the Spirit that guides us, the Holy Spirit that holds us up. <laughs> you look around. Not all of this is us, my friends, because we are all carried on the shoulders of God's Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Lord, you do carry us when we can't take another step. <laughs> We continue to move forward because of your spirit, and we give thanks for that. Lord, we are your church, and we're honored to be so. And so we give you thanks. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Join me for the chorus of We Are the Church. and respond to the word as we join together for our affirmation of faith. Today we share the Apostles' Creed found on eight, page 881 of your hymnal. And let's unite our voices and our hearts as we share in this historic profession of our Christian faith. Will you join me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. seated. Friends, our ushers are preparing to come forward now, so let's offer our gifts and our tithes to Almighty God. Loving and holy God, we give thanks for this day and for the opportunity to share these gifts. They represent, O oh God, all that we have. And we pray that we're generous. Use us and use these gifts for the glory of your kingdom and the work of the church. In Christ we pray. Amen.
sing together our closing hymn, the third, fourth, and fifth verses of We Are the Church, 558. Receive the benediction and followed by the chorus of sweet, sweet spirit. Oh God, we give thanks for your tender blessing and for the empowerment and strength you give us to be the church. We have great news to share with all the world. And so give us now your peace that passes all understanding. In the name of Christ, we pray.